Hey guys, it's Chill here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. Today, our task is to implement some vertex transformations. So we've got our, our little, you know, handicapped uh, hexagon here. And uh, we want to spin this mother trucker. So from 3D fundamentals, you know, okay, we're going to be looking at a matrix, a rotation matrix, right? And we're probably going to be implementing this with the vertex shader, and that's all correct, but there are extra things that you're gonna have to do in Direct3D, and we're gonna cover them today. We're gonna work with a new type of resource called a constant buffer, and we're gonna see how that fits into the whole pipeline system. So, we want to rotate this guy. So that means we're gonna have to get a rotation matrix, a transformation matrix, to the vertex shader. And then the vertex shader is going to multiply that matrix against all of the vertices in our mesh. Now one thing you might be wondering about is why do we insist on doing all of our transformations on the GPU side in the first place? Why do we have to do it in the vertex shader? Uh, and the answer is we could do it on the CPU side. We could transform all the vertices and then load them over every frame onto the GPU. But think about it, your meshes, they often will have thousands or tens of thousands of vertices, and you don't want to transfer all that data over every single frame. That's a lot of bandwidth to use. So what you typically do is you have a static mesh. It doesn't change over the entire scene. So you load that once at the beginning of the scene, and then every scene, in order to move that mesh around in the environment, you just change a matrix. Uh, so this would be a dynamic constant matrix, it, constant meaning that it doesn't change over one draw call. Uh, so it'll remain constant for all the vertices in the mesh. They all see the same matrix, and we transfer that, we update that matrix once every frame. And I mean, instead of updating thousands of vertices, which is, you know, many, many thousands of uh, floating point numbers, we're only updating, you know, 16 floating point numbers per frame, and that's a hell of a lot better. Now, of course, in our current code here, we're actually transferring over every frame anyways because we recreate this vertex buffer uh, within this function and we destroy it at the end of the function. But in a real engine, you're not going to be doing that. This is just some test code. The other reason why we want to do this on the uh, GPU side is because the GPU is a highly parallel processor. It's going to do a way better job of transforming thousands of vertices. So now that we have that uh, question answered, the next question is, well, how do we get our matrix over to the GPU? And the only way we really know of at the moment to get that information into the GPU pipeline is through the vertex data, right? But think about it. You don't want to be attaching a matrix, 16 floating point values, to every single vertex, especially since the entire mesh, all the vertices, are going to see the same matrix. So you'd be duplicating the same data however many times you have vertices, thousands of times. That's a terrible idea. So the answer is we use something called a shader constant buffer. And now this will allow us to bind some constant values to a shader stage and they will be available for every invocation of that shader. So we can bind a matrix to our vertex shader, and that matrix will be available for every vertex that it processes in the mesh. And so we've just identified our first task now. We've got to create a constant buffer. And a constant buffer is a buffer similar to a vertex buffer or an index buffer. So it's gonna be a similar process to create one. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna define the structure of our vert constant buffer. Constant buffer. So what is it gonna have? Well, it's gonna have a single four by four matrix. So we'll create a struct and we don't need to give it a name. And a four by four matrix is basically just a floating point array of a four element. So it's four by four array, right? Each element of the array, we'll just call it element here. So you go element zero, zero, element zero, one. That's good syntax. And the name of our structure here will be transformation because that's what this matrix represents. And there you go, we've got our constant buffer. We could add more constants and we might later on, but right now all we need is a transformation matrix. Now we've actually got to create some data for our buffer. So. So now we're going to create an instance of constant buffer, call it CB, we're going to initialize it. Uh, it only has one member, that is the matrix, which is just an array. So we're going to initialize that array. We're going to format it nicely so you can see the structure of the matrix. And you can see right here, 
very plain for anyone who's followed 3D fundamentals. This is a rotation matrix, rotation around Z. Uh, we haven't defined angle, so our function is going to take angle as a parameter, and that's important because it's going to have to change from frame to frame as we spin our retarded hexagon. All right, so we've got our constant buffer. Now we actually have to uh, create the resource. So the process for creating the constant buffer is the same as for any other kind of buffer. Uh, we need a uh, pointer here, interface pointer, and then we need the descriptor and the subresource data. The only real difference is here, of course, the bind flags is now going to be constant buffer. I'm setting the usage to dynamic because that's how you typically use a constant buffer. You update it every frame and you need a dynamic buffer to be able to do that. Um, but we don't actually need it to be dynamic in this test here because of course we're just recreating the buffer every single frame anyways. But typically you would not recreate it every frame. You'd create it once and then you'd update it. And to do that you need dynamic. So I set this to dynamic and I also set the uh, structure byte stride to zero because this constant buffer it isn't an array like the vertex buffer is an array of vertices or the index buffer is an array of indices so you don't need to know the structure byte strides zero is just fine for this and subresource data takes the pointer and then you create that bad boy now we got to actually bind this to our pipeline and the constant buffer let's see your p con text uh, it doesn't get bound to the input assembler like the uh, index or the vertex. It gets bound to the actual shader that is going to use that con constant. So we go VS for vertex shader, set constant buffers. And you can see here it says set buffers. So we're going to have to do some more array shenanigans here, aren't we? Uh, so the start slot. Um, there are multiple slots for binding constants, but obviously we want to start at zero. We don't have anything else number of buffers we're only going to set one constant buffer and then again we need the pp but this isn't the pp for filling this is the pp as an array of pointers so what do we do p constant buffer dot get address of right we all know this by now one interesting thing to note here is that unlike for the uh, the vertex you don't have to describe uh, the layout of this constant buffer it doesn't do any checks for that sort of thing uh, you just got to bind it to the vertex shader. Now, if we build this, it should build fine, unless I did a typo. Nah, so draw triangle does not take zero arguments. So I changed the uh, the signature of draw test triangle. It has to take an angle. So let's set that to zero. So now we see there's no build problem, but if we run it, we're going to see a problem here. And the problem is D3D usage dynamic resource may only have CPU access right. D3D11 CPU access right. And that makes sense because if you're creating a dynamic resource, you are going to be updating it from the CPU every frame, basically. So access flags with no CPU access doesn't make any sense. So we set this to D3D11 CPU access right. And if we build that, it runs. It runs perfect. Now, it's not going to do anything different, of course, because our shader hasn't, it's not making use of that constant buffer yet, but it is available for the shader when the shader wants to take advantage of it. So, next step is actually making the shader use the constant. So, to make use of the constant buffer, we have to declare it in our vertex shader. And it couldn't be easier. It's just C buffer, and you see that's a special uh, keyword in HLSL. We give it a name and we'll just call it. C buffer, it doesn't really matter what we call it. Uh, and then in here, we give what is in the buffer. And this has to match up with the layout that we uh, described in the C++ side. So we have one matrix, and we'll call it the transform. And that's it. Now we have this available, and we can use it. So if we want to multiply matrix by a vector, very simple, we just use mol. There is a uh, built-in function at HLSL called mol. Now, matrix multiplication is uh, right multiply. So the vector goes on the left, the matrix goes on the right. Got to keep that in mind. So we just put transform. We put the matrix on the right here, the vector on the left. And now all of our vertices will be multiplied by the transform that we bind to this uh, shader stage. One thing to note is that when you're actually using the constant, you don't have to use do like cbuff dot or cbuff colon colon. You can just use this name directly like it's a global and it works. And here we see that it builds fine. That's perfectly fine syntax. But in order to see that in action, we got to do one small change to app. We have to animate our rotation angle. And we're just going to use timer dot peak again in here. 
for the angle of rotation, and that's going to work fine for us. Let's run it and see if it breaks. It doesn't break. It does indeed rotate. Beautiful. And there you go. We've just bound a constant buffer to the vertex shader, and we've used that to transform all the vertices in our model here. Now looking at this, you might notice something a little strange going on with our model here as it rotates. To highlight it a little more, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this vertex and I'm going to make it touch the very bottom of the screen at zero degrees. So now when we look at the bottom tip here, we see that uh, it touches the top and the bottom when we rotate, and that makes sense. But it also touches the left and the right side, and that doesn't make sense. Because think about it, this thing, I mean the viewport, is wider then it is tall. So if it's just touching the top and the bottom, then it should not reach to the left and the right, but it does reach there. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, it all goes back to normalized device coordinates, right? Normalized device coordinates, the space is a perfect square, and that maps to the rectangle of our screen. And uh, so you have to basically account for that uh, mapping by squeezing it back down in the width direction. This is I've covered this in uh, 3D Fundamentals when I talked about the transformation matrix. Now we're not doing a full transform yet, but I do want to squeeze it so that my proportions are correct for my model and it doesn't get stretched in the, uh, the X direction. Now the aspect ratio of our window here is 4 by 3. So in order to counter that effect, we want to multiply by three quarters only in the x direction. So how you could do that is you could multiply by a uh, scaling matrix that has three quarters in the x part and then one in the rest of it. And multiplying by that matrix is exactly the same as if we just multiplied this column by three quarters. That's just some basic uh, linear algebra for you. So this matrix here is basically just a concatenation of a rotation plus a squeeze in the x. And that should give us the effect that we're looking for. Except that you see when we run it, it hasn't given us the effect that we are looking for. It's still touching both of the sides and the top and the bottom. So what gives? Well, here is the great deception of direct 3D. Uh, someone's asking, why is transpose required in my, in my uh, transformation matrix? And the answer is, in CPU, arrays are stored row major. So basically, like I've done here. But on the GPU, they're column major. So what that means is that on the GPU, it's expecting this here to actually be this column here. So in order to make things jive between the CPU and the GPU, you have to transpose. You've got to flip things across the diagonal. Now there's a few ways we could go about this. We could manually transpose this initialization here. I don't want to do that. We could also create a matrix class and give it a transpose operation. So we could just call transpose before we send it over to the GPU. I don't want to do that either. Luckily, there's a third option. We can tell HLSL that this matrix is actually row major. And then it'll say, okay, I understand you now. And it will generate different operations when we try to multiply. It will uh, generate operations to be consistent with a row major matrix. Now, this has the downside of uh, multiplying by a row major matrix on the GPU is slightly slower than by a column major, but it does make our life a lot easier. Uh, in the future, we are actually going to transpose it on the GPU side before sending it over. But for right now, this is going to make our life easier, which I enjoy very much. And now you see it's hitting the top, but it's not hitting the left and the right. So now, the, uh, the shape is not being distorted as it rotates. And that, my friends, is a beautiful thing indeed. So, take home message of this is, of course, uh, you got to be aware of the uh, the row ordering, row major and column major, between general what you do on the CPU and what HLSL defaults to. One more thing you'll notice is that before we were rotating clockwise, now we're rotating counterclockwise, which is what you would expect, because a positive angle of rotation in just general mathematics gives you a counterclockwise rotation. So now we're perfectly consistent and everything is running nicely. Now it might seem very annoying to you 
to have to, you know, figure out all these matrices by hand. I mean, in 3D Fundamentals, we created a matrix class, and then we could just concatenate, you know, rotation, scaling, translation matrices together to build the transformation that we want. And uh, luckily, Direct3D also gives us a mathematics uh, library to handle matrices like that. And that's what we're going to look at in the next video. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more hardware 3D.